Hi, I'm Dr. Gemma, and welcome back to Cognitive, the Knitting Psychology Podcast. Cheerfully and somewhat irregularly in business since 2008. Segments today may include what's on my hooks, needles, and spindles, a strategy, something I really like, put a lid on it, oh shoot, and blather. So sit back, put your feet up, pick up your knitting, crocheting, spinning, weaving, or dyeing, (laughs) or any other yarny thing you're doing, and get ready to enjoy. Well, hello there, good evening. I'm Dr. Gemma, and this is episode 105 of Cognitive, and I am recording this at 8.43 p.m. on Sunday evening, November 20th, 2022. Hello. Wow, I just finished recording 104, so maybe this one won't be long, but you never know, do you? (laughs) A lot of things have happened in a few days. It's rather surprising. I certainly enjoy your comments because I'm recording right on top of the previous one. You didn't make a lot of them, but (laughs) that's okay. You can leave your comments on the blog at cognitivepodcast.blogspot.com or on our group on Ravelry, which is just called Cognitive, but of course spelled our special way, you know, wink, wink, in the warm thanks department. Thanks, everybody. I'm really grateful you come back to listen. I'm rather pleased to know I still have an audience. Also, uh, at the end of this episode, there will be an interview tagged onto it from Stitches. I'm not sure who I've got queued up yet as I record this, but it will be one of the vendors from Stitches, and so I hope you enjoy it. I have to dig that out and edit it. But meanwhile, warm thanks, everybody, for just coming around, and I will tag that interview onto the end with one of the vendors. Oh, COVID, you know what I'm going to say. Every week they talk about the next wave of COVID. And as Trevor Noah keeps pointing out on The Daily Show, nobody really cares. But it's still real. It's still out there. Keep yourself vaccinated. Vaccinate everybody else. You know the drill. We've been living with it for a long time. Sadly, I have still got patients who have it. I have still got patients who have it and are not vaccinated. I've had quite a few of those. It really just seems remarkable to me. Remember next time you drive past your primary school and you've gotten your shots, wave hello to the heirs, to the really good teachers who taught you, you know, fourth grade science. (laughs) And for all the rest of them, really sorry. I think the experiment is concluded and the vaccines work. I don't know, 100 million people or so, you got to start believing that. Okay. Apart from all that, I have the link for where you can get an electronic vaccine record online if you're in California. And otherwise, I will pass over that. What's on my hooks and needles? Oh, no, I haven't finished anything. I really thought I was going to finish the Hailing Frequencies hat. But no, where is it? As I record this, I'm about eight and a half inches in the body of the hat and you have to go, I think it's nine and a half. So I'm about eight rows away from going on to the crown decreases. This is the basic ribbed hat from Pearl Soho, which I really like because it's just a straight up pattern for DK weight yarn. And I think if you're me and if you every now and then need to get some real finished object gratification, You have to have a good hat pattern for just every size of yarn there is. So I have my standard for bulky, which I think is Lion Brand's basic pattern, which is mostly stockinette. But then Pearl Soho for the DK, this is the one I use. And it's it's, uh, ribbed all the way up. It's just a 1-1 rib. And uh, sure, you could guess it. (laughs) But I really like it. Thank you to the kind people at Pearl Soho for quite understandably making it free. This is in the Hailing Frequencies Open Colorway, which is a DK Superwash in this case, from Dizzy Blonde Studios. She dyed this and another colorway. And every time I try to remember the name of it, I want to say something like Reach for the Sky or Reach for the Stars or something. Anyway, it's the colors of NASA blue, white, and green. And these are both in honor of the late Michelle Nichols 
of the original Star Trek fame, and I'm really enjoying this. When I got these, I said, oh, you know, I don't want to increase my stash. I'm really trying to yarn fast. Har, 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 har. <laughs> See my picture from last week of last week's stash acquisitions. Even so, I'm trying to go through a lot of yarn. And I looked at this colorway, and I, I really am getting more and more in love with it. I loved it because it's so evocative to me as a fan of the original series, who actually used to watch it in 1966. Believe it or not, I'm that old. But I thought, oh, I'm never going to use those colors in anything. And, you know, there are all sorts of interesting patterns you could make where you have one colorway you're not so big on mixed with another. But I just decided to do this straight up because I really do like it as the evocation of Ohura's Starfleet uniform colors and all. And I somehow couldn't bear to mute the colors. So anyway, I'm just making it straight up into a hat. That gets it in and out of the stash. We have in our living room the hat bin. We have a bin. It was supposed to be for hats and scarves and gloves and whatnot, but it's mostly turning into hats. And it's just hats that if you're going out the front door and you need a hat, you can grab a hat. And so this will be in the hat bin. And I'm pleased about it because I'm really falling in love with it the more I work on it. And of course, I'm fond of all of Laura's dye jobs anyway. She's a wonderful dyer. And the thing she does, now for me, every dyer has the thing they do. And this is really in her wheelhouse that I really like her yellows, her orange and orange browns, and I have to admit it, her Starfleet red. So this is really what Laura does best from Dizzy Blondes. And so enjoy it. Go get yourself a skein of it. She had it in several different weights, but I went for the heavier weight because I wanted to make a hat for the reasons I've just told you. Also, I'm grateful to this hat because from it I learned that when you post now on Instagram, it's really easy to add music. And to my delight, I was looking for music to add to the first picture of this that evoked sunshine and happiness and ended up with Bob Marley and the Whalers. <laughs> so, sort of proud, you know. Again, it's just... Uh, I don't know, it just, it makes me feel like sunshine. It makes me feel like, oh, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> it makes me feel like Bob Marley makes me feel, you know, just, there's a mood there. All right, so the Hailing Frequencies hat, that is hopefully going to be done the next time we talk, which is good because it is time to do the annual Christmas socks. And I reached into my stash. I have two skeins left, apparently, of holiday yarn. And the one I'm looking at, because it was on the top, is Forbidden Fiber Company. I think this is Gluttony Sock. They did this a few years ago as a Christmas special. I think it's from two years ago, 2020. Anyway, so that is sort of on deck, waiting to get wound to be my next pair of socks. But I don't feel that sockish right now. I really want to get through this hat, partly because I have so many other projects. Meanwhile, the lane splitter has gotten no love, that skirt. I have to figure out where I put the skein of cheap cotton yarn I got to make the waistband of it, and that's part of what's holding me up. But I really know when I sit down and devote myself, I'm going to tear through it. I'm kind of looking forward to that, but I just have too many things going on right now, like wanting to get hailing frequencies out of my stash before it goes in there and is never seen again, you know. They don't know yet. That is my ongoing thing. Oh, we have a lot of excitement there. We have a lot of excitement there. They don't know yet. You may remember that I should finish the number of blocks by, I think, December 8th. I've got a few more than I need right now, but roughly about that. But you may remember I did take 19 black blocks, because I know that's the bottom row, and line them up and clip them together and start seaming them. The game plan was to go to 19 by 19 blocks, but I've been kind of saving room in my head in case that's too big. It shouldn't be, but you know, you never quite know. Well, okay, I seamed this one row is now completely seamed. So I've got 19 blocks seamed together edge to edge. It looks terrific. It really does. And I took it in the bedroom and laid it on the bed. It's huge. It's great. It I laid it across the bottom because that's going to be 19 blocks wide, you know, across the foot of the bed, no matter what else. The only question is, how long from foot to head do I need to do this? 
Well, I'll tell you, 19 blocks is looking mighty long. However, I think I like that. So I'm still not sure if it's going to be 19 by 19 or 19 wide by 18 long, but that's okay. I got a heck of a lot of blocks. So today I also put together row two. And this is from the bottom up because I looked at what I have in terms of the, my darker colors that I want at the bottom and sort of worked that out. And so row two is transitioning from black into, I, I guess it should be violet. I'd call it more of a dark maroon. And from there it's going to go into an indigo blue. And so I'm alternating some black blocks in with the maroon to sort of have a gradual transition. In row three, there will be one or two black blocks and probably black blocks on the outer edge and then one or two of the indigo mixed into the maroon. So we're moving through the maroon. So anyway, I have this row and I can do it. I put them together, I clipped them together and I seamed it and I may have seamed the black row in the wrong direction. I may have turned it sideways. I'm going to check that tomorrow in the daylight. This is so easy to fix, it's not funny but it makes me really happy that the first row of 19 is done and I'm on to the second row of 19 and you know there's only going to be 18 or so of these rows 18 or 19. This is not hard it is not onerous I thought it was going to be a lot worse than it is. Will it take all of next year? It's probably going to take a lot of next year. I don't mind. It's just great because for the first time I was digging in the bottom of the big box that I want to clear out that had all this yarn in it and finding the leftovers that I'm using for seaming. And I was resorting these into the way I want them to be. And it just felt like so progressive. It's so great to say I'm almost finished crocheting the blocks and I'm partway through, a really respectable partway through the process, not quite 5%, but still, of seaming the blocks together. The other thing I thought, well, you know, you make all the rows and then you connect them. And I've realized as I look at this, that's not how it's going to work. I realize that what's more likely to happen is that I'm going to do a whole row and then do row two and then connect the two rows and then do row three and connect that and so on. So I suspect that's how it's going to grow because it is enormously satisfying to see it get big. So I'm not treating it like a, you would assemble a quilt. I have to admit I'm treating it more like just letting it grow as it goes. Okay, no love on the Pennsylvania Dutch embroidery and no love on the wrapped in tiny chains. As soon as I finish ASL, I get a break between December and February 6th. So as soon as I finish, I'm going to get onto the wrapped in tiny chains. I'd really like to get that finished. It's not hard. It's not at all sophisticated. And I'm getting really good on mattress stitch. So stitching those pieces together feels like a piece of cake. And again, that will take some yarn out of the carton at my feet that I'd like to get out of this room. <laughs> I'd like to empty. The Lady Eleanor No Love, since I last recorded, we are on skein four out of 11 skeins, possibly 12. I'm still searching my stash to see if there's one more I can add in. I'd like to go as long as I can on it. I'd like a really big wrap here is what I'm saying. You can see in the show notes my favorite resources. They all have links now, so I will let you roam through the wonder of that. I don't have a link in there yet because I don't know who's going to be in the interview, but I will try to dig up the link for whoever I'm interviewing at the end of this. And the interview, of course, is from last week at Stitches. Oh, and the good news, Stitches SoCal is on for next year. I heard rumors it wasn't going to be, but no, they've got it on the back of their program. That They've got the dates and everything. So yay, Stitches SoCal seems to be with us. Someday we will recover from the pandemic. We missed a lot of people there this year. Uh, I remember Peachy and I think we're talking about who's not here, and it was really, it was sad. It really was sad. I also regret because Laser Sheep was there and I never got a chance to check in or talk to them. I quite like them. I, I really miss them, I have to say. Oh well, enough of that. Let's see what else. So Dizzy Blondes, well, I really didn't mean to spin, but if you look at my show notes, you will see that I am spinning. Why? Well, again, I, I blame this on Gigi Knitmore, who said blend silk with the cat fur single. Okay. I blame this totally on her because you know how when you put something in plain sight, you stop seeing it after a while? 
I was trying to empty my fleece bin that I used to have in this room and I pretty much succeeded. And I don't know if you remember this, this would be the summer of 2021. I got really hardcore about spinning up all this fleece I had. And I had a lot of plain fleece, plain colors, nothing, you know, no dye or anything. And uh, so I did. And you may remember that what happened was then I had all this hand spun yarn and I looked at it and said, it all goes together. And I made the Mad Skills Mammoth sweater out of it. And that made me so happy that I went on and used more of my reds and pinks and purples and made the, I think of it, the feral Easter egg, which I think of as my spring Romeo sweater. <laughs> Who knows? There may be a spring Romeo these days. You never know what'll happen. At any rate, so I emptied that bin and that was great. Got it out of here and then put this carton instead with all the yarn from the temperature blanket. Oy, I never learn. All right. Well, when I was doing that, I ran into a bag of silk hankies from Redfish Dye Works. I adore Sandy and Elf of Redfish. I haven't seen them in a while, which makes me feel a little sad. But one day I was walking by their booth, probably at Stitches West 2019 would be my guess. And Elf just threw me a bag of hankies, or Sandy did, and said, here you go. And I, it was so beautiful. It's an ounce. Do you know how much is in an ounce of silk, particularly in the form of silk hankies? There's like eight or nine hankies in there, if that few. Okay, and so I stuck that on my desk, my work table, right above the yarn bin, or the fiber bin, and just sat it there. And it's, I've just been moving it out of the way, literally for two years, year and a half, saying it's really annoying, and just moving it around, and not touching it. And I tried to spin it on my wheel, and I wasn't really being careful. I wasn't thinking about what I know, because I've done silk hankies before, but I wasn't really working on this. So there I am thinking about what Gigi said about spinning Minerva against silk. And I bring home these two luscious braids from Pearly Shell last week. And so, of course, I have them in the bag at my feet. But on my desk, there's all these silk hankies. You can hear how this went. So, yeah, I pulled out a drop spindle. And I started really, really hand drafting the hankies and I kind of relearned what I used to know. I had really forgotten. You have to put a lot of work into silk. Now you don't always. It is possible to have it combed out and all that nicely but these were really in hanky form and which means you have to spread it out a lot and I tried to feed it into my wheel but it didn't work. There's too much humidity and the hankies I had scrunched them up so they'd gotten too compressed so I've been doing a lot of finger drafting. Well of course there's Minerva's fur. I'm looking at it on one of my beautiful spindles from Yorkie Slave, who's no longer making them as far as I know. And there was another Yorkie Slave spindle next to it. And these are great. These things are quarter ounce spindles made of balsa wood. Very well balanced. Extremely long shaft, which I think adds to the balance. And extremely lightweight. And of course, that's what I'm spinning Minerva on. It's like a, a charka. You know, it's like using a charcoal. You can spin really, really short stuff on it and you can get a really fast, high, tight spin out of these things. So I'm rather in love with it. Okay, so I pulled one out and said, let's just do a little weeny bit of this beautiful pink, purple, blue hanky. And then I realized that it's a kind of, I don't want to say it's gradient, but the hankies go from green, yellow, and then there's green with a little bit of the pink and the blue, and then there's hardcore pink and blue. Anyway, I did not stop to look at all this. So I'm spinning them in kind of any old order. And I'm not really worried about it because I'm spinning them at cobweb. This is the thinnest and the finest I think I've ever spun something. And it should blend really well, at least in a two-ply, probably a three-ply with Minerva's fur. And that's what I want. I really want to be able to ply with a very tight twist to keep the cat fur from pilling. And so I'm really seriously thinking of a, I think it's a Faroe Island shawl. I want a, I may have this wrong, and I cannot remember whose ethnic knitting book I had that had all the different shawl types, but I'm sure it's on my shelf, so I'll go roaming and you'll hear more of this. At any rate, or I will go find that book again. I know I will know it when I see it. I'm looking at Victorian lace today, though, right now, so that might be the book I'm thinking of. At any rate... So I am thinking serious, hardcore, high skills, wedding ring shawl here. And I am thinking about a big shawl because I got a lot of this stuff. 
and also I have the two braids that I got from Pearly Shell. So, so this is all up in the air, but I'm going to really be making some hardcore lace weight, and I'm looking forward to this enormously, and it is fun to be working on it. And again, I'm just getting a little tiny two inches, maybe three inches from Minerva a day, and she's not shedding very hard. I have to tell you, her coat is now incredibly soft and fluffy. It's really, really marvelous. On to the strategy. We were doing Dear Man, and we're on Man. And the M is for mindfulness. Now, remember, Dear Man is about how to tell people what you want. It is not about how to tell people what you want when you're under pressure, like when you believe they're going to fight with you or argue. It can be used for that. Dear Man is just the all-purpose, anytime you're asking for what you want. Okay, no matter how sympathetic or unsympathetic your audience. There is a step past this called fast, as in running fast, and that is for how to stay in a confrontative situation and stay clear on what you want. Stay clear on your goal. We'll get to that. I've mentioned it so many times before anyway. You're probably singing along with me at this point. But meanwhile, we're in the M of Dear Man. And it's for mindfulness. And this is not, you know, I'm not saying stand there and say Om and repeat your mantra and, you know, roll your eyes partly up and meditate. That's not that kind of mindfulness. The mindfulness we're talking about is stay present in the moment, which means a few things. Number one, stay focused on what you're doing here. Stay focused on what you want. Because often when you're asking for something, the other person will quite unintentionally bring in new information that surprises you. They may become aggressive or they may make a personal comment that is not appropriate or they may try to redirect the conversation. Okay, so when we talk about mindfulness, we're talking about knowing what you came for and staying on what you came for. So, you know, you say to your boss, okay, I really need to discuss a raise. Boss goes, well, you know, we already did your annual review. And you say, thank you, but I do need to discuss a raise. <laughs> you keep bringing it back where the boss says, well, we'll talk about that after lunch. Okay, you say, what time will we talk about that? Because I'm ready, but I'm perfectly happy to talk about it now if you're ready, which the boss will say, no, they're not <laughs> in this example, probably. Okay, but you stay on target. You stay on what you want. You remember why you're here. And so the mindfulness also, though, is about you have to keep track of your internal state. If you're really anxious about what you're doing, you have to really hold steady and say, no, this is okay. Remember the A? I'm just calmly assertive. I'm confident. I'm okay. I can do this. The worst they can do is say no. So you have to also be focused on just maintaining the steady state you're in and not being distracted, okay? In a way, the M is about all the other letters, I suppose, because you also need to think about just relax. Remember that you're nodding, you're rewarding, you look focused on the other person. Part of mindfulness is don't jump to your next point. Watch the other person. Watch for their response. Again, this is back at R, reward your listener that nod, smile, maintain eye contact, look friendly and approachable, don't get frustrated if you think they're saying something negative, don't interrupt them, okay? And that's all the mindfulness. Keep yourself present in this moment. You have prepared for this, and now you're here and you're doing it. That's what the M is about. So when you are talking to someone else, you're doing the M. You're staying on topic, you're staying focused on what you're here to do, you're not allowing for changes of topic. You are remembering to respect the other person, to meet them eye to eye, to be positive, and stay with them in the moment to hear what they are saying. Not coincidentally, you're probably hearing on the ACT model, if you know the ACT model, you're probably hearing right now, stay in the present. That is mindfulness. In a word, being here now in the present, that is mindfulness. And so, you have to keep your focus. You can't let your mind wander. That also includes body stillness. For those of us who are somewhat hyperactive, this is the challenge. But you have to keep yourself still. I struggle with this. I'm sitting in a rocking chair, and I love to rock. 
And when I'm in session, I'm in this rocking chair. And there are times where I really have to make myself stop, where I have to realize the patient is interpreting my bouncing up and down in the chair as a failure of mindfulness. Now that's really interesting because it doesn't ruin my mindfulness. That actually relaxes me. However, you're asking for something. You're trying to show the other person that you are there for them. So it's not about what you think. I'll be much better if I use my fidget toy. It's not about that. It's about what your audience is thinking. Again, you're always talking to an audience. So if your audience is distracted because you're rocking in your rocking chair, stop it. <laughs> Stay present. Remember what you're here to do. You're in communication and their response matters. So this is the M of dear man, the mindfulness. Stay right here, right now, and remember what you're doing. Pay attention to what the other person is doing. And remember to just stay on your topic. Okay, on to the fluffy books. I haven't changed much. I'm in the middle of A Treacherous Performance, which is one of the Beatrice Hyde Clare series that starts with A Brazen Curiosity by Lynn Messina. And I'm bored. I'm bored. I've been listening to it, and I'm kind of bored. I'm sort of sorry about that. These are pretty empty. I mean, there's not a lot of message or meaning or anything beyond clever verbal, you know, discussion and all that. So it's a little bit dry and that's a shame. There's a lot more in this series, but it's not particularly intellectually challenging or controversial in any way. So let's just move along, shall we? The new things I did this week were on Netflix. I watched the second Enola Holmes film on Netflix. These are a creature totally unto themselves. These are not the books. Now, I have to say, I am really glad that Nancy Springer, the author, was able to sell the rights and these movies were made, but they are not the books. I'm glad the author's making money. I really am, because this is not a property that I would have expected to really succeed this well. But it's doing great. Millie Bobby Brown is producing them as well as playing Enola. And I really do think she believes she's on this feminist mission, if only she was. However, the first film was just, no. It was fun, but it was not Enola Holmes. Second film, a little bit better, a little bit more feminist. But again, you feel a little regret that they're just not using the novels. However, I really enjoyed it. I think the second film was even better than the first. I really don't need the male hero at all. I really don't need the way we're glorifying Sherlock at all. But it could be a lot worse, and they are fun films. They're just teen girl romance films with a dash of Sherlock Holmes thrown in and some rip snorting adventure. Sure, in both the films and the books, Enola has this fantastic mother, although they go in very different directions. I have to say the cast is superb. Again, David Thules does this amazing turn as the bad guy. And he, again, it's one of these things they always do with him. He looks like a nice guy, but he's really good at playing villains. So they do tend to bring him into movies, you know, like Wonder Woman. And and show him like he's the really nice guy in the beginning. And then you begin to realize how really rotten he is. So it's, it's really quite good. So I did enjoy the second Enola Holmes film. Do I prefer it to the novels? Not a chance. The novels are a very different beast. They're very feminist. I would want my daughter to read them. I just think they're great. The films, they're not as feminist as they think they are. But they're smacking good adventures. And it's just kind of a different animal. I'm also back in Extraordinary Attorney Wu on Netflix. I'm about 13 or 14 episodes in. And I thought the tension was getting so high, I thought, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to finish this. I really like my literature predictable as I age. I don't want a lot of trouble. But I have to say, they're really taking on some issues. And what I like, like any good narrative that does that. They don't give you pat answers. That's what I really, really like. So, you know, Shakespeare, King Lear, he never gives you a solution. He just gives you every possible solution and you have to decide what would have worked if anything was going to. However, may I remind you, in Jacobean tragedy, everybody dies. <laughs> 
But the thing about Shakespeare that makes Shakespeare great, if you ask me, why are we still watching Shakespeare after all these years? Because the message of Shakespeare is there's never going to be an easy answer. Even in the comedies, you come away feeling sort of unsettled. And he will explore all the possible answers, but Shakespeare never picks one. And so they're very, very thought provoking. Okay, it's true. I am comparing this show to Shakespeare, but I am really happy because the overarching plot line is about a high functioning person with autism. And all of this is arguable. There's been a lot of controversy about how autistic the character is or how realistic the character is. And I'm not going to go there because I'm just sitting here going, look, they're trying to be sympathetic to autism. I'm really happy about this. And in that overarching plot, they are now really exploring how her life has gone, about what this disability is like, how people have been reacting to her her whole life, how her father raises her, what it takes to raise her, what it means that she's a genius and yet she still has, shall we say, quirky behaviors or less neurotypical behaviors. And they're also taking on these issues in the episode to episode plots. There's a very smart episode about a guy who's preying on cognitively disabled women and how much choice a cognitively disabled person is going to have in their life, in the direction of their life, including in terms of deep, intimate relationships. They really go for it. They go into things about the Korean school system. They are really digging into a lot of issues and they finally have reached a moment where they're talking about what it means to be a lawyer. And they're asking, is it a conflict morally for attorney Wu to even be an attorney in a big famous law firm? And so they go into feminist law and problems with the law and all that sort of thing. I'm so impressed with the way they're handling it. And just when you think, well, they have created a rather two dimensional bad guy, he turns out to be more th three dimensional. And there's an insanely good episode about all the cows coming home at night, as my father would say. There's a great episode about what personal moral responsibility do people bear when they join a group like this big law firm thinking they're going to do good and then they get sucked into cases that are morally dubious. There's a, a wonderful symbol of literal blood sucking at the end of it. And it just blew me out of the water because they're holding everybody accountable. So I cannot recommend Extraordinary Attorney Wu enough. It is thought provoking and intelligent. How accurate is it? Hard to say. I have never met any two people with autism who manifest it in the same way. It is a syndrome. So there's a lot of different symptoms and all you need to get the diagnosis is enough of the symptoms to manifest to interfere with one's life in a major way. But I like what they're doing. I like the thoughtfulness and the intelligence of it. I like the fact they get that attorney Wu has a full functioning set of emotions. That's not her problem. Autistic people are often treated as though they are without emotion. That's not what's going on. And it's, it's very sweet. It's very funny. It can be heartbreaking. It's just really, really good. So that would be something I really like as well. But since you ask, I also put in a picture of my latest restock from Frostbeard Studios and their candle making. They do soy candles. So those are not polluting, which I like. So I'm gradually switching my stock over to soy. I still have this fantasy that I'm going to make my own supply of soy candles. But it's that time of year, everybody's starting the Black Friday sales. And at this time of year, traditionally, for me, I restock on the candles, on the non-toxic cleaners around the house, and on the soap bars. And so I have just finished doing all that. And I've got a ton of all this stuff now, and I'm really, really pretty set for the winners. So what I like, I like the annual Black Friday, pre-Black Friday, really restocking on things. And the picture there is, I think I got nine candles from Frostbeard. This time, instead of getting their big candles, I actually got small ones because number one, I want the containers to
to experiment with my own soy candles when I make them. But number two, I'm wondering how effective it is to burn a big jar candle versus a small one. I'm wondering, and I will probably sit down and try and work out some kind of experiment or test for this. Because, you know, do I want to spend all this money on a big candle? Also experimenting with different fragrances. And so I didn't want to commit to the big candles, which is good because some of them really just smell like aftershave to me. <laughs> Put a lid on it. This is a simple thing. I am buying keto shakes, I have to say. Keto chow. I am buying those. And I don't think they're particularly keto because I just think anything that you rip open a packet to get into is not. However, they do use cream, heavy whipping cream, or butter. Now, butter leaves a strong flavor in the shake. I've also used coffee in them, and that leaves a strong flavor. So basically, I'm using um, heavy whipping cream as my fat, and then mostly water and the powder. However, somebody introduced the idea that you can use these as creamer for your coffee. You know, that's really good. It's really good. I've been trying different flavors, and so far, the best ones that I've used as a creamer. What it is, I make a shake every night and I put it in the fridge overnight to kind of dissolve and all that and get thick. And it really does. Okay. And I have all different flavors. I'm messing around with flavors. I have to say, they're, the flavors are okay. There's some really good ones. There's some so-so ones. Chocolate's great. It's their universal favorite. And it should be the chocolate peanut butter is good as long as you use water in it. These come out very thick, so often through the day I go out into the kitchen and just add water to them and put them back in the fridge and thin them out a little bit. So they can be kind of an all-day thing. Currently, as I sit here, I've got part of a peaches and cream left. That's very good. I didn't like it at first. I was like, meh. But I didn't love it. You know, I just thought it was okay. But actually, as I'm drinking it, I'm enjoying it. The surprise is gingerbread. The gingerbread apparently hit big last year. And it's a terrific creamer in your coffee. So, you know, you just put a little of it aside and you pour it into your coffee in the morning. It's very good. So there will be more of that under my tree, I hope. The other one that's good as a creamer is the chocolate. That's pretty good. The chocolate, peanut butter, okay. It's not its best use. Vanilla, surprisingly, really forgettable. Not at all worth it as a creamer. So anyway, I leave you to that. I have a link to the website under put a lid on it in the show notes this week. This brings us tearing down the home stretch to the blather. Not much. This is week 14, I believe, week 13 or 14 of ASL. I'm not even sure how many weeks we have at this point. It's really been a break. We've been watching the documentary, as I think I told you, and just doing discussions. I also managed to get myself to another deaf event. I didn't need to. I went and I got a reality check. Three other students from my class were there. That was so much fun. And they did not work at it nearly as hard as I did. They just sat together and talked, whereas I was talking to deaf people and meeting people from other classes. So, you know, I realized, okay, people aren't working that hard on this. And I went back and wrote my one-page essay. And, like, they were like, oh, it's a two-page essay. So, you know, no, it's not. I'm looking right at the assignment. But they were getting a lot of things wrong. And these are people I thought were doing really well in the class, I was kind of let down. They were struggling to speak at all in ASL. We ended up talking out loud a lot and signing as we talked. I mean, we could not have looked more like amateurs if we tried. But it was a lot of fun to finally meet them and talk to them. I really enjoyed them. I realized how hard we're all working. Everybody kept saying, this is a hard class. And I felt better because I thought, you know, really, I'm working awfully hard for this. They were horrified because I told them, they said, oh, you know, we never get feedback. You know, we don't know how to handle the exercises that we have to do as quizzes and we get things wrong and we don't know what we got wrong. And I said, yeah, I bought the answer key. And everybody froze. And I said, oh, it's like you could buy the original textbook new or you could buy the teacher's pack for like 14 bucks extra. And they were sort of horrified. And I said, well, you know, I didn't do it until I realized she was never going to give us feedback on our work. And I just decided that I need the feedback if I'm going to learn this. And they were all like, oh, no, you know, we can't do that. Blah, blah. And I said, well, I don't need this. And they were surprised. I was too, because two of them were seniors in high school. They need the credit. Okay, fair enough. The other, though, was a 40-something-year-old woman with an advanced degree in counseling. And so I was quite surprised that, like, I thought, you know, 
why do you need this grade so much? But she was very worried about it. And I said, you know, I'm just taking it pass fail because it doesn't count anyway. If I want to major in sign, you can't count this course because it's too low level. So I don't know why they're all fixated on this, but we had a lot of fun. And so I finished that and that's nice. Another assignment gone. And tomorrow night I spend 15 minutes with my teacher going over my story from my childhood, which is called the big yellow horse. So I'm going to spend tomorrow going over that and reviewing my vocabulary. I really need to get back and practice. What surprises me is the other students kept saying they were forgetting signs, saying they weren't in practice. I was so surprised. I thought, I'm really working at this very hard, and apparently it's paying off because I don't feel that forgetful, but I have not done a lot of work with vocabulary and practicing this week. Okay, but that's ASL. The pop date, we have not had much training because this was the week where I had to go to the hotel because of my allergies. So we'll get back into that. I was working a little bit with Queenie and Captain today, though. And we're winterizing the house, so they have to learn a new way to go in and out of the house. We're working on that. The hub's date, he's doing fine. Everything is calm. I'm very pleased because he did not take the freeway two days ago, or yesterday, I guess it was. And the reason I'm pleased is his car just suddenly turned off while he was driving. His water pump went foul. So that was not a crisis. He pulled over to the side of the road, got a tow, got to the local Toyota place. They said, oh yeah, you know, it's your water pump. Now, what I am pleased about though, he I called him just to find out where he was. And I called him just when he'd realized he was stuck and he had called AAA for a tow truck. So that was good. But he said, I, my engine's not working. My engine's not working. He does tend to go to the big stuff, to the big scare. And I was using the Vinx. I had it in his car. And sitting at home, I was able to diagnose the car and just said, no, your engine's fine. You got a great charge on the battery. Everything's looking good. It says it's a minor subsystem. It doesn't identify which one, but it says just talk to a mechanic. But none of the big systems are out of sync. And so then I sent him all the pictures of the Vinx app doing its diagnosis and said, you know, if they give you any trouble, you know, you show them this. Well, of course, he takes it over to Frontier Toyota. First thing they notice, he has an OBD2 sensor in his car. So they knew when we pulled in there, they, they or when he pulled in there, they knew already that he knew what was wrong with the car. So that was really great. And so I said, you know, grab the sensor on your way out. Don't let anybody else take the sensor out of the car because they might be able to transfer the account. So I have to tell you, this was another reason why we use the Vinx system to track and monitor our cars. This was a great success and I'm extremely happy about it. On the calendar, the Romeo break for me will be December 26th through 31st. Really, it will be December 25th through January 1st. I'm taking that week off. So I am lining up the projects and I'm looking at a big heap of drafted silk hanky just waiting to be spun as I say that. And I've got projects all over the place all around me. The Grand Canyon, we are on track for that in June of 2023. And I have tentative plans for Sunnybank, August of 2023. I do have my hotel on points already reserved, so that's pretty happy. Finally, Minerva gets the last word, and the last word is now appearing live on camera, because if you look at the picture, I'm sitting in front of my blue screen, and you will see a tail that Minerva is passing under the range of the camera, but the tail. So it is very typical when I'm seeing patients to have the patients start laughing because there's a tail or some ears passing through the camera that they can see through the picture they see on my camera. So Minerva now has developed the habit in the middle of session, she jumps in my lap and starts kneading hard with her claws in my thigh, trying to get me to brush her. And I get a lot of tail action where I get bashed with her tail or the tail goes by my face fast. That is her way of trying to get my attention. So there she is, Minerva, now appearing live on my camera. You can see that's a picture from Zoom. That's me taking a picture of my Zoom screen after seeing a patient. So there you go. Okay, everybody, that's it. Remember your COVID precautions. LA County is now talking about indoor masking again because cases are so sharply on the rise here. So, you know, brace yourselves, get your shots, wear your masks, particularly in a crowd or a building 
wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands, yes, wash your hands, and try to socially distance. Most of all, remember, everybody, please, we are a community. We take care of each other, and that takes care of ourselves. So please, everybody, stay safe, take care of each other, and I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. So now I have Alexandra of Alexandra the Art of Yarn. And I'm like standing in front of this insanely beautiful booth and that Pharaoh's making me crazy. So this is the Andrea Mowry. Oh wait, me. Okay. This is the Andrea Mowry throwback sweater and I'm gonna learn how to steak it when I finish. Oh because it's wow. actually a cardigan. Yeah, I can see because I can see the break at the yeah. neckline. Yeah. The, the color on the neckline. I mean, that, first of all, that sapphire background is sensational. Isn't that great? That is, that is, that is yours, that, I assume. Yes, that yarn is over <laughs> Good, here. I'm probably going to go visit it now. <laughs> <laughs> but So what we're talking about is... Seal Rock. Seal Rock, and it's 100% superwash, right? Uh-huh. Two, uh, size 3 and a 274 yards on 3.5 ounces. So that's a... It's beautiful. Okay. Yes. We do sizing on purpose. I'm enjoying it. Right. Sorry. I... And then next door to it is the Agate Beach. And Which that's a is sparkly, in case sparkly you're not... yarn. Yeah. And it's 93% superwash, 7% Lurex. Oh, I like this yarn because it's the sparkle is now spun into the yarn. Right? So it's yeah. not going to come out no, of your lap like a No, and it's a size like one, a and it's a really nice tight... Yes, yeah, uh, tight twist. We yeah. like a tight twist. Really tight twist. I on like that. a tight twist. That's beautiful. It's not and this pill. comes in 409 yards. Over here, this line is a superwash silk line in uh-huh. the fingering. Yes. And uh, this yarn line was designed for the uh, solar eclipse because I live in Oregon, and we were in the 100. percent You got a good view. Yeah, yeah. we were the 100 percent zone. And in the DK weight, it's 75% superwash merino and 25% nylon. 274 yards here in the DK, and in the fingering, it's 437. This line is made and milled in the United States. It's called Pendleton, and it's a true DK, maybe a light worsted. Blooms a lot in the mm-hmm. in the dye. And um, it comes in 280 yard increments. So it's a completely US made product. Mm -hmm. Just making sure everybody's got their stories. The Rainbow Bridge kits come in the Yak version. Superwash Merino Yak in in nylon. And those are 175.25 Superwash Nylon for the brights. Mm -hmm. The brights have a little better yardage. Those are 92 yards a piece, and there's 10, so and 920 the yards. Is, fingering weight. That's a fingering, okay. And these ones are the yak version are 87 yards times 10, 870 yards. Fantastic. And it will make that shawl up there with one skein of regular yarn in between. Which is breathtaking. <laughs> and that's the rainbow bridge pattern. And the code is on the back of so the pack, so kit. you can get yeah. it free download. These kits here come with five free patterns. One kit, this, this is the small fries kit. Wow. There is, Such a each deep. kit oh my has God, these are one beautiful. sparkle yeah. and one speckle. This is a yak silk blend in the middle, the main color. Mm-hmm. And then this gradient around. One kit will make the... Faded honeycomb hat and cowl set. And then you can also have a capelet or oh. a stole. And then there's a crochet pattern that I can't find. It's visiting somewhere. It'll it'll come back, yeah. But let me ask you, do you have an online presence? I do. It's Alexandra, the art of yarn.com. Okay, so you do all of this would be available to my listeners as well. All of this well. is available online. All the colors are up there, everything. All the kits are there. And and what you can't see, and one of those moments I'm having where I wish I was a video podcast because you can't see the colors. And the, what's really impressive, the colors are just everywhere. There's like, you want a color, you're going to find it. The kits are spectacular. And the really interesting thing for me is the selection of fiber that you've got alpaca, you've got stellina. I don't have any alpaca. I'm sorry. But I, I do a lot I'm of I'm trying cashmere. to say yak, and it came yeah, out alpaca. I do. I do yeah. yak, I do cashmere yeah. silk, I have a bunch of superwash, I have a bunch of si- um, 
sparkle. We do all our own gradient shawl cakes in house from start to finish. Which are fantastic. And uh, a lot of dyers aren't doing that anymore. And then I have uh, a real, like, I call it the poor man's hand spun. It, it's because it has that effect to it, looks to it, it right? It does, yeah, it it's 100% super wash. Yeah, it's beautiful. The line is called Safari uh, after the place that is a safari in Roseburg, just below Roseburg, Oregon. And um, each one of those skeins is dyed one at a time. It's a different dye technique, and so it makes a different texture in the knitting. No, it's really, it's. It, um, so it's kind of just, it's just kind of fun. It's rustic in the right way. Yeah, like as in right. when I spin and I do a bad job, it's rustic. But when I spin and I do a good job, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. rustic. And yeah. that's it. It's got that wonderful that's exactly. and texture. All the kits like that it you're doesn't look machine made, right. is what you're saying. All the yeah. uh, kits that are on line and, you know, that your listeners can look at all come with free pattern downloads when you wow. buy the kit. Nice job. So this hat kit here will make that hat. This brown and, and lovely green will make that capelet. As I already showed you, that kit will do that. That yeah. kit will do that. And then there's one more kit over here that's called the Guilty Pleasure Kit. And it's called this because it's a MCN sock yarn oh. fingering weight with a Yak Mini. Wow. And it comes with four oh, different beautiful. free patterns that come with it. And when I say free patterns, I mean you can put all the patterns in your shopping cart and then use the code and you get four for free. You might only be able to make one thing, but then you've added but three you free patterns, patterns for, yeah. you know, for not much. Well, and I think the other thing that I'm, I'm so goggling at the yarn, I'm not saying the obvious, which is that if you were at the booth like I'm, I am, you would see like the sample range is spectacular. Yes, we yeah. have quite a bit of samples. Beautiful bunch of samples. Um, of, of all these patterns that Alexandra is saying are free. And, and also just other things that you can make with the yarn. You know, mm -hmm. uh, some are, you know, in the intermediate range, but many are in the simple range. You know that this isn't, I'm not interested in making really hard patterns that knitters feel like they can't, you know, achieve. Right? Well, what I actually like about the patterns is, I'm not sure I'm in anything but the simple range, but what I like is knowing what I know, like this is the gift of a pattern that looks much harder than it is. So you look at Correct. it and you no, I actually could do that, but it really comes out looking sophisticated. Yes. Really nice, really yes. beautiful stuff. Yes, 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 for yeah, sure. Absolutely beautiful. For sure. And different textures and color work and striping in, in really good creative ways with change of stitch in between stripes. So it makes exactly. it look much more complex exactly. than it, it is. You look but, way, they, but they like look you very sophisticated. Oh, it's very sophisticated. That you didn't it's beautiful like the yarn stuff. did the magic for you. Well and also Peachy was saying, well you know you've got to you got to you've got to see this. And because I was ooing and awing over something else that was very luxe and she's like, oh no, you have to see Alexandra. So yep, yep. That's thank why. you for coming. Really appreciate it. Thanks for coming to Stitch It. So we have come to the end of another episode of Cognitive. Please do not use this podcast to diagnose yourself. If you think you are having a mental health problem, please contact a licensed mental health professional. Show notes for these episodes can be found at cognitivepodcast, all one word, dot blogspot.com. Episodes can be found at iTunes under the name Cognitive Podcast, but also can be found posted next to the show notes on the blog spot page. Thank you so much for listening. Everybody stay safe, take care of each other, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.